On Story is brought to you in part by the Alice Kleberg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. From Austin Film Festival, this is On Story, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. This week's On Story, comedy writer and performer, Kevin McDonald. Sometimes you get an idea and you get that chill, and when you write a sketch, um, there's two amazing sensations. The second best sensation is when the sketch goes well that you've worked so hard on, but that's the second best. The best is the first time you think of that idea. In this episode, Kids in the Hall comedy writer and performer Kevin McDonald discusses sketch comedy and performing with his famed Canadian comedy troupe. Right before I met Dave Foley, I remember being uh, 18 and um, I'm not sure what I was going to do. I had just been kicked out of uh, theater school because um, I knew I was funny, but, uh, but I knew I wasn't stand-up comedy funny, which I've been proving all week here doing stand-up. <laughs> So I just started to write sketches. I thought I would write sketches, and then I would uh, send them to people. I didn't know who. And um, SCTV, at that point, was my favorite sketch show. I mean, overall, it's Monty Python, but SCTV was happening then. So I wrote parody. And I remember in the same afternoon, I wrote two sketches that are really similar. But, um, uh, but I, I wrote a, um, a parody of Psycho, in the movie Psycho. It was called Psychosomatic. And it, it was just me in the shower screaming. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. And then the other sketch I wrote, which is sort of the same kind of idea, it was a parody of The Odd Couple called The Odd Schizophrenic, um, uh, where I was both uh, messy and tidy. <laughs> and my mother always said, Kevin, I know you uh, want to be an actor, but I don't think that's your talent. I think it's writing. She always, uh, she always said that. She would say things like this, my mother of truth. She would say, I don't think you're good looking enough to be an actor. She would say, <laughs> she's dead! <laughs> She paid for it. So um, I went to Second City, and in the fr for the first year, everybody was over 30. They weren't that funny, in my pompous uh, opinion. And, and there were two teenagers, and I thought we were the only ones who were funny. And the other teenager was Mike Myers. And, um, but he was like special funny. He was like, uh, like a, uh, a wonderkind, is that the word? Um, he was special. I was like a, a lumpy potato potential. He was. <laughs> As good as he ever became, he was good like, already at 17. He was like two years younger than me. Um, and you just knew that he was special. And he, um, by the end of the year, he got hired for Second City. And then the very first uh, workshop without um, Mike Myers, another teenager came in. He almost looked a bit like him if Mike Myers wore glasses, and it was Dave Foley. D Dave, uh, I didn't know him. Uh, and uh, Alan Gutman was the workshop teacher, and he, uh, just by coincidence, he, he paired us in groups of twos, and I was, Dave and I were the two, and uh, we had to do the mirror exercise, where you mirror each other's movements, and we hadn't even talked to each other, but all of a sudden, I guess it's the word chemistry, I, it seems like a hokey story, but um, we started doing funny movements, and then we started going down to the ground, and then we mirrored each other in the fetal position, <laughs> And then we started crawling outside of the second city onto the street, <laughs> Lombard Street. And I remember Alan Gutman ran out and he went to the door and like through the screen door, you could hear him, come back, get back here, get back. And, um, and we were laughing our heads off. So we were the only funny ones <laughs> in the workshop. <laughs> but we had like a chemistry kind of thing. And so I went to Dave after, I didn't know his name. And I, uh, I went to the class, uh, I went to him and I said, um, you know, do you want to uh, join my comedy troupe? I didn't have a comedy troupe. <laughs> and, and he said yes. And then I phoned um, my friend Luciano Casmiri. And I said, we have to start a troupe. And there's a guy, he's another Mike Myers. We can't let this one go. And, um, and that's, that was the original Kids in the Hall. Luciano Casmiri, uh, Dave Foley, and Kevin McDonald. So then, I mean, you're, as you've pointed out, incredibly young um, and you're, your troupe then somehow in the next few years gets the attention of 
Lorne Michaels in a TV show. And you were all really young when you started the show, too. So can you talk a little bit about how that process worked? I think our intent was to be different. Um, we were also, like, friends first, and we, um, we just happened to be funny. And we, uh, we just, it's, but we were funny in a different way. Uh, Dave Foley, when he got drunk, he would say, we're like the Sex Pistols of comedy. And that sounded like a, <laughs> a bit pretentious. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, but, uh, but, but we were always, I don't mean this as a compliment, because um, this works both ways, but it turns out that we're original thinkers. And so sometimes I work and sometimes it doesn't. We auditioned for Second City several times and um, until later when Lorne Michaels uh, um, uh, discovered us, but there were three left in Toronto that, that they hired us just because of that. They would not hire us. And um, they, were, they were very honest. They, they said, you're too weird. And, um, but uh, we're Canadians, so we thought they were just being nice. <laughs> we thought they meant, you're not good enough. Um, but as it turns out, we were weird. The only blueprint for sketch comedy was Monty Python. So I think we didn't go around saying this a lot. Maybe Dave and I did a bit, but we always thought um, we'd get discovered. We'd have a TV show. It would run five years. Then we would do a, a movie. It would be a gigantic hit. And then <laughs> And then we did a, we would do another movie every four or five years, like Monty Python. And the way we do have a less successful like blueprint, we we do that. We do get together every four or five years, but now because of brain candy bombing, um, it's like it's usually for a tour. I I wrote before I knew the Kiss and Hall, but uh, as soon as it was Dave Foley, Bruce McCullough, Mark McKinney, and um, and Crazy Scott Thompson, I was so intimidated by them as writers. For the first year, I sort of, uh, when we were just a stage troupe, uh, before the TV show, I sort of just stopped writing. It, it was too intimidating. The way that Mike Myers had intimidated me, um, they're all like writing geniuses. And how we wrote in those days was we'd come up with um, uh, ideas, and then we would write it through improv. So I, I got my say in through other people's ideas, like writing, like, like coming up with lines and stuff through um, improv, but uh, I was too afraid to tell my ideas. And I was starting to write in the last like year of, that we were a stage troupe. Um, we didn't write through improv anymore. They introduced us to this 80s thing called computers. And um, <laughs> so I was in a cubicle and I could do, do whatever I want all day. And then we, uh, the nervous part was bringing it into the read through. Um, but you get used to that after a while, even though we're all very mean people uh, giving notes, still you get used to it. So talk about that process of working with these, this new group of folks you're working with. I mean, and I know you added on people or switched out people, whatever, along the way. Yeah, people would quit, new mm -hmm. people would join. Myself, Dave Foley, Bruce McCullough, Mark McKinney, Scott Thompson. Um, uh, the other really good ones got better jobs, so it was us five losers that were left. <laughs> And, um, and we, we almost quit working together. And then Mark McKinney said, why don't we try one more time? That, that was like, uh, it was like, that was, it was simple as that. So we, um, uh, we had a club, um, there was a club on Queen Street West in Toronto called the Rivoli. And uh, they were famous for gothic rock bands and waiters and waitresses who never smiled. And um, for some reason we got the, that club. So every Monday night, from uh, the summer of 84 to the summer of 85, we did um, uh, uh, like a show of uh, completely new sketches. We sort of pretended that we had a TV show. We did uh, a scene called If Elvis Was My Landlord, um, where, <laughs> where uh, Bruce, uh, he's having a party, and then the landlord said, uh, says, uh, get, stop making so much noise, and Bruce kicks them out, and then he uh, turns to the audience and he says, it wouldn't be that way if Elvis was my landlord. <laughs> And then I come on stage and I, uh, I'm dressed as Elvis and I go, I just want to tell you to tap your garbage bags before you put them down the chute. Makes my job that much easier. Thank you very much. If Elvis were my landlord, we'd say stuff in the halls like, 42 tenants can't be wrong. <laughs> Gee, I could go to his house anytime and borrow a cup of sideburns if Elvis were the man. <laughs> How you doing? Well, I just wanted to tell you to top your garbage bags before you put them down the chute. <laughs> Makes my job the much easier. Thank you very much. <laughs> I remember Ray Conalog, he said, we read the review, we try to be cool and not care about the reviews, but uh, he said, the kids in the hall assume that their audience is as smart as they are. And we sort of went, yeah, we do. Yeah, we assume they're smart. Yeah, yeah we do that. That's what we're trying to do. Um, <laughs>
And then um, this was the summer of 85. Lauren Michaels had quit Saturday Night Live five years previously. Um, and it was um, right at the beginning of that summer that he had uh, announced that he was coming back to Saturday Night Live. So he was um, sending uh, talent scouts to comedy cities all over North America. Toronto was one of them, um, because that's where you got Dan Aykroyd and Gil Durander, and that's where he's from. And then on our last show, the Sunday afternoon matinee, um, Yvonne Fasson, who, who was the Canadian guy who was the president of Late Night at NBC, and the, he was like only 30, and then he became the president of CBC a few years later. He, um, Lauren sent him to see us because of the good review. Actually, it was Yvonne Fasson's idea, and he saw the whole show, and the next uh, morning, um, uh, I got a lot of excited phone calls, and, uh, and then we had a conference call with Lauren Michaels. It's funny watching yes. those Kids in the Hall episodes now, that, especially that first season. You all were so, so very young. And it seemed like, especially that first season, that you were writing a lot of material that was um, really playing into that. And, and one, huh. one scene, I'm, uh, you know, the, especially in the pilot episode, one scene I'm going to particularly point out was one of the first sketches where they're, uh, I think it's called Guys on a Break. The very first uh, sketch in the pilot episode was, was, uh, was um, uh, th th this, like, was it Bruce? He's in his uh, bedroom right, he's and he's bedroom. being woken up and he's, uh, right. hey, you millionaires, get out of that uh -huh. garbage. So then, so then here's another one that also fed into that, the Reg sketch. Remember his hair? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was always perfect. Yet you never saw him with a comb. <laughs> I can't believe he's dead. To Reg. To Reg. To Reg. Uh, You know, guys, seems like only yesterday we were just a bunch of kids hanging out and getting Slurpees. Next thing you know, we all got jobs. Or girlfriends. Yeah. Next thing you know, they're moving in with you. Next thing you know, you're out buying piano wire. <laughs> Good, strong piano wire and sneak it up an old Reg while he reads. <laughs> jobs become careers. Girlfriends become wives and Reg becomes a lifeless corpse in your arms. I would say if anyone would ever ask us to put a uh, sketch in a time capsule, nobody will. I don't think there are such things as time capsules. I would pick that sketch because it sort of defines us in a way. You guys seem to have this utter innocence in your performance, um, and I would, especially in that first season, but almost every episode has a very dark turn yeah. to it. I think uh, we're just dark naturally. We all had horrible childhoods, like many comedians. Um, but we seem to embrace it more. And um, Bruce McCullough, um, he was the first one to write dark stuff. And he seemed to open the door for us first to think, oh, dark stuff is good. There's one sketch he wrote when we were a stage troupe. And Reg was his idea that we all wrote together. But Reg was his idea. Uh, he was the king of dark comedy. The thing with dark comedy, though, I think if you go around saying, what dark sketch are we going to write? I think you're screwed. If you go for darkness, um, I think you've got to write what you write. You've got to write what you write naturally. Um, and later people would tell us, that was really dark. Uh, how Scott's character died in the sketch of AIDS, but he, even though he's dead, he keeps saying cancer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's really dark. And we say, oh, yeah, I guess you can see it that way. One of your episodes in season one, you also did a, um, a sketch that was writing a sketch, writing yes. a comedy sketch. Yes. But from your real perspective here, like from your storytelling perspective, what, what, is, um, what is the sort of genetic makeup of a great sketch, one that would actually have made it onto the show? I did go to Humber for three months to study theater because I didn't know what to do first. And the one thing I remember was the very first thing that the, I don't know if he's called a dean in, in Canada, but the, the, I'll call him the dean um, of the acting program. Uh, the, the, ver the very first class, 9 a.m., the very first point, he had a blackboard, and Jerry Smith was his name, and he uh, wrote, um, in our business, it's all about this. I did, in our business, I hate that kind of talk, but after that, it got cool. Um, <laughs> it's all about this, and he wrote the word idea, and then he circled it a thousand times, and that really excited me. And then later, um, in a sketch troupe, um, I re that's what it's all about, the, the idea. Um, and when we get an idea, sometimes you get an idea and you don't know and you have to work on it, but sometimes you get an idea and you get that chill, and when you write a sketch, um, there's two amazing sensations. The second best sensation 
is when the sketch goes well that you've worked so hard on. But that's the second best. The best is the first time you think of that idea. Um, uh, the, the, the very first time that I thought of the idea uh, oh, what if Bu Buddy Holly, before he died, he was a real mean guy to everybody on the plane and deserved to die? I remember like getting that like that thrill. Oh, that's a good idea. And every time I get an idea, and I'm wrong all the time, um, uh, I always think, this is my hit single. Um, this is my stairway to heaven. Uh, I get really excited and I write it down. But the, um, the second sensation that happens after the first sensation is always disappointing. Once you write it on paper, it is always flat. Because in your head, it's the most exciting thing in the world. You can do anything with it. You can go anywhere with it. Then when you write it down, it's, it's like death. It, like, uh, it's always disappointing. And then you learn craftsmanship, especially if you have a TV show for five years, and you learn how to pump as much life uh, into it as you can to get, um, get back to the first time you had that exciting idea. Can you talk about like how something would become a recurring one and how you knew that that was really a successful one and, and at the germ of the idea, you know, what were you thinking to, were you looking at it as a long-term sketch? Um, uh, f uh, first of all, I want to go back to Alan Gutman, the workshop teacher. He, he said another thing that sort of influenced the kids in the hall, the, Dave and I were in the class. He said, um, when you find a comedy partner, the best way to come up with ideas is spritzing. And we didn't know what spritzing meant. And spritzing is like vaudevillian speak for just hanging out with somebody and coming up with ideas. Um, uh, for example, um, Dave Scott and I were walking down the street when we were just a stage troupe way before the TV show. And uh, Scott told a horrible, dark story that I can't tell on television um, uh, about his life. And um, uh, he said, I, I guess I have demons. And then Dave told an even darker story that I really can't tell on television. And he said, uh, I guess I have demons. And they looked at me because I'm like a light, jello pudding to them and and they said uh yeah they sarcastically like you have demons huh kevin and i said uh, yes polite demons that would open a door for a lady carrying too many parcels but demons nonetheless <laughs> yes i'm a man possessed by many demons polite demons that would open a door for a lady carrying too many parcels but demons nonetheless <laughs> yes I've walked along the path of evil many times. It's a twisting, curving path that actually leads to a charming block garden. But beyond that evil! <laughs> and now I would like to bring on one who could be the spawn of Satan himself, manservant Hecubus. <laughs> Good evening, Hecubus. Are you ready? I am ready to serve you, master. And Satan. And then they laughed, and then we started writing up Simon and Hecubus. Uh, so spritzing uh, um, is very important. Now, uh, running characters during the Kitson Hall TV show days, our uh, rule was that um, the running characters' sketches uh, could only go in if they were as good as any other sketch that week. King of Empty Promises. Um, uh, <laughs> for those of you who don't know which one that is, uh, but may know it, if I, it's where I promise to do things, and they say, will you do? And I go, we'll do. And then when, when I don't do them, uh, I, I go, you said you were going to do that. I go, slip my mind. Yeah, I came in the office one day, and I said, Norm, I don't have any ideas. What are we going to write today? And Norm said, uh, Kevin, why don't we write about that horrible thing that you do to people? I... I uh, what horrible thing? So what well, you always promised, like uh, like Chris Cooper, our editor, you you said you were going to make a tape of that Paul Simon album for him, and you never do. Um, uh, let's do that. And it's true. Uh, my only defense is that I'm a child of an alcoholic, and I want to please people, so I promise them things, and I mean it at the time, but then an hour later I forget, and I don't care anymore. So did you bring my videos? Slip my mind. <laughs> Should I even ask about the Godfather? <laughs> Don't bother. <laughs> Man, this is starting to cost me money, you know. I mean, sure, the video store is going to be on my ass, and rightly so, because when you rent a video, you enter into a sacred trust. I'll tell you what. Let's have dinner tonight. Pesto's at eight. I'll bring the video. I'll bring the Godfather. You know the Paul Simon album you've been wanting me to tape? Yes. I'll tape it and bring that, too. And dinner's on me. You don't have to bother with all that. Just, just bring me the video. No, I want to. I'm just sick about the whole thing.
you've now written these things, you've worked them, you've rehearsed them with each other, right? Right. How much when you actually get into the performance mode and you're, you're getting ready to do the show or doing the show, how much ends up being improv added to that? That was the weird thing because um, when we were a stage troupe, we were writing through improv, so there were no scripts written down. And then um, there were a lot of ad libs. A lot of things that became famous jokes from the scenes were ad libbed during live performances. So that's and, uh, our second city training. Uh, that's sort of what you learn to do. And it's exciting, and it's sort of the, the fun part of the job. In TV, all the ad libbing can be done in the ad libbing has to be done in rehearsal because you mess up camera blocking, um, and so for the, the first season it was full of like ad libs and mistakes that uh, you'd hear our director John Blanchard yell cut, and we had to start the scene again. Is if you're going to put that in, just let me know where you'll be when you. And then so we learned to restrain ourselves for that. But Dave Foley in 1985. Now that I'm being talkative, uh, we hated improv, but we loved doing it. But there's something we hated about it. I remember him saying, um, "Improv is the new." mime, meaning that we didn't like <laughs> But we love it. It's love-hate. You were a mime, weren't you? You were a mime as Jerry. That, that rings a bell. Uh, here's a boring story how we thought of that sketch. Um, we, were, uh, they were, we were doing a Kathy sketch. Um, the two Kathys and uh, the Bruce's Kathy was dreaming that she was a beauty queen. And so we were, um, um, we were all playing women um, in the beauty contest. And uh, the, the, the makeup put on wigs on Dave and I. And then Scott screamed, my makeup is horrible! And then there was an emergency and all the, the women had to leave for an hour to calm Scott down. So uh, Dave and I were in a dress and wigs but no makeup. And we started acting like two clearly insane people. <laughs> Um, we're clearly insane people. We don't. We're not really women. We're. Uh, I'm Jerry Sizzler. This is my sister, Jerry Sizzler, and uh, <laughs> and we laughed our heads off when we wrote down notes. And by the time they were ready to film us, um, we had the sketch written. Yeah. Spritzing. Alan Gutman, 1981. What's going on out there? Nothing, hon. Just an old army buddies drop by. <laughs> you go back to sleep, dear. Look, you've got to keep your voice down. Look, Jerry! Look, my name isn't Jerry. It's Lister. <laughs> and your name isn't Jerry either. It's Jean-Pierre. <laughs> Don't be silly, Jerry. That's a French name. Yes. And before you became chemically unbalanced, you were a respected French mime instructor. <laughs> Jerry, you are clearly insane. No, I am clearly not insane. You are the clearly insane one. Jerry, I'm not clearly insane. I'm your sister, damn it. I'm your sister. Now, quick, put these on before you catch your death. Here's the trick of writing. This is a show about writing, right? Here's the trick of writing. <sighs> We're always trying to find out what it's about. And even if you've done your TV show and you're still working on it, uh, during the tour, uh, Kids in the Hall, we are, we're always on the bus after always trying to figure out a... I remember we did it in our last tour after our last date. We, were st we, we, we came up with something that was, oh, that's great, we, this is how we do that sketch. But it was over, it was over. You're always trying to figure out what it's about. And sometimes the editing is like the final draft in writing. Sometimes you figure out editing. But you young writers, you young writers out there, um, uh, you're always trying to figure out what it's about. It's never over. So it also, <laughs> it also sounds like you're, that one of the elements to writing great sketch comedy though is knowing the people you're working with so very well. And chemistry and friendship. Dave and I uh, have this chemistry thing where we, uh, uh, on stage and in real life, and I've never liked this with, I'm not like this with anyone. I have chemistry with the other kids in the hall, but Dave, like it happened that day when we both knew we were going to go down on the, on the floor and crawl outside. Oh, um, we can't, this sounds phony, but we can sort of read each other's minds because there's this thing in improv that used to be called blocking. I don't know what the kids call it nowadays where you're supposed to say yes and. Um, you're not ever supposed to say no because that sort of stops the momentum of the scene. But, sorry, <laughs> but if you're with us, like someone that you have, close chemistry with, Dave will say something, and I know that if I say yes, I'll be blocking his idea. I know where he's going, and I know he wants me to say no, because he has an idea. Take, I just know that, and he knows that with me. Um, and that's, you either have it or you don't. It's like falling in love. You've been watching A Conversation with Kevin McDonald on On Story. On Story is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's On Story project, including the On Story PBS series, now streaming online, the On Story radio program, the On Story podcast, and the On Story book series, available where books are sold. 
To find out more about OnStory and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com. 